Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here, not only from the service academies, but also from uh, our universities around the country. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that it's terrific that you all have this program. I know that probably everybody is saying that to you, but let me throw my two cents worth in on that as well, that 30 years ago when I attended the Naval Academy, uh, there was no such conference, and I think that our need for leadership in our country across a variety of spectrums and a variety of disciplines uh, really calls out for the kind of thing that you're doing here. I truly believe that leaders are both born and made, and you get better even if you have the innate characteristics to do it well by talking about it and reflecting on it and doing the kind of things that you're doing here today. Uh, General Eisenhower, a West Point graduate, uh, said that decision-making is of the essence in leadership, which is to say that making good decisions is really important for good leaders. And so in that spirit, what I wanted to talk with you for a few minutes today is about decision-making in crisis. And I know that many other uh, esteemed people are going to give you their thoughts on that subject or similar subjects. And I asked what I was supposed to talk about here today, and they said, anything you want to talk about. So what I choose to talk about are two temptations that I think face leaders who are in crisis situations. And these two temptations, number one, is the temptation to play by your own rules during the middle of a crisis. And by that, briefly, I mean to, in the heat of the moment, to discard the rules that you're normally used to operating under and that your organization works within and to make up your own rules, number one. Number two is to make decisions without the benefit of disagreement. That is to say, to rush to a decision without having sufficient dissent and argument and disagreement before you make the decision. And, and both of these things, and I know many of you are in leadership programs and you are in the service academies, think and talk about leadership a lot. These temptations are present, I think, anytime somebody has to solve a problem. But I think they're aggravated and they're accentuated in, in crisis situations because during crisis, first of all, the, the circumstances sometimes drive you to make decisions quickly under deadlines. And even if the circumstances don't require that, you are feeling the weight of the decision, and that pressure and the weight of the decision creates its own momentum driving a decision toward a resolution. And I think in those situations, when, when there is a, a real or perceived need to do it quickly, and the decision is complex, I mean, it wouldn't be a crisis if it were easy, right? When a decision is complex, then people are looking to get rid of obstacles. They're looking to get rid of barriers and get rid of things that will interfere with what they want to be their laser focus on the crisis or the problem in front of them, which leads people, I think, to be tempted to do away with the rules, which get in the way, or, or, and or to stop listening very quickly to opposing voices. And that, that's what I'd like to reflect on a little bit today, and then hopefully we have a chance to talk about it a little bit. A couple of disclaimers right up front. <clears throat> uh, I'm a military guy. I've been in the military for all of my adult life. And so it goes to say, it, it, it figures that most of my examples and my experience are going to be military experiences. And for those of you who aren't in the military, I apologize for that. But I do think, and I'm actually 100% confident, that the principles that we talk about have much broader application in the military. The thing, these ideas aren't limited to the military. And whether you are in the public sector, outside of the military, somewhere in government, or you're in the private sector, be it for profit or nonprofit, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that you will face these challenges if you're in a leadership situation. I have no doubt about that, and it doesn't matter what discipline you're in, you're going to have to deal with this or somebody that you're trying to help and assist in leadership is going to deal with these things. I want to start off by reading a quote from, that was in the 4th of January issue of the New York Post. 
and it's by a gentleman who I don't know named Ralph Peters. And Ralph Peters is writing about the war on terror and his frustration about how well Al-Qaeda is doing and how well the enemy is doing. And Ralph Peters says that it's literally a bloody disgrace that our ragtag enemies innovate faster and more effectively than our armed forces and the legion of overpaid contractors behind them. Our enemies ask themselves, what works? We ask ourselves, what will the lawyer say? And the crucial difference, our enemies believe in victory even if we don't. So there you have it. Um, Mr. Peters has kind of framed the thing that I'd like to talk about very nicely, which is rules get in the way. And I think that it's uh, useful to think about why people feel the temptation to abandon the rules during crisis and during other circumstances. Let's put aside right away the fact that some people are just crooked, that some people are venal and greedy. That's too easy. We don't need to spend any time talking about that. What I want to talk about are people who are sincere and who are trying to solve a crisis and who, for whatever reason, decide that the rules don't fit anymore. Two examples. The first one would be, let's take speed limits. You're driving to the hospital. The speed limit is normally 35 miles an hour. You have a sick child with you, and you say, you know what, I believe in speed limits generally. I think they're a good thing. And I even think 35 miles an hour is the right speed limit for this stretch of highway. But in this case, I need to do something different. I need an exception, so I'm going to go 55 to get this sick child to the hospital. So situation one is the person who believes in the rule but just wants an exception. Situation two, I think, is more along the lines of what Mr. Peters is talking about, which is I don't believe in speed limits necessarily at all. I think that a 35 mile an hour speed limit for this highway is antiquated. We now have cars that are built more safely. They have better crash and safety systems. The highway's been widened, but besides, I'm really an alert driver all the time, and so I reject the notion that the speed limit applies here at all. These are people who want to do away with the rule set, and I guess a real life example of this might be found in our own approach to the war on terror in the earlier part of the decade as it related to people that we had took into our custody, detainees. There were many people in the, in the administration, in the Bush administration, well-meaning people, sincere people committed to our country who declared at the time that new rules apply, that the old rules, the old rules being the Geneva Conventions, which for those of you who are familiar with them have, have governed the treatment of detained persons for many, many, many years, that the Geneva Conventions don't apply anymore and we need a rule, new rule set which they made up as we went along. Uh, I want to talk about three risks that you face as a leader if you decide to set aside the rules. One of those risks is internal to your own organization, and two of them, I would argue, are external risk. So the first one, the internal risk. What happens when you as a leader decide that you are going to depart from the rules, set aside the rules, that the rules are too much in the way, are too cumbersome, and that you can't solve your crisis without making up your own rules and doing it on the fly. I think the first thing that happens, and going back to the speed limit for example for a minute, is the person who goes 55 to get the dying child to the hospital. Once that rule is broken, psychologically it's become easier to break the rule again. And so the person who went 55 last time to get the dying child to the hospital now a second time decides, well, you know what, it worked out okay last time. I think I can probably go 60. My child's not dying this time, but my child has a bad cold, and I need to make that appointment, and then I need to get back to work. A real life example of this came from a person that's really esteemed here at the Naval Academy named uh, the now late Vice Admiral Jim Stockdale. And Admiral Stockdale, any of you who know of him, his background, many of you will not, was a prisoner of war in Vietnam for seven years, and during his captivity there was savagely beaten many times, kept in isolation for years uh, cumulatively, and returned home to much acclaim in our country for his heroic 
uh, behavior there and won the Congressional Medal of Honor. But Admiral Stockdale reported that what was interesting to him when he was in prison is that they had their own code of conduct and their own rule set for the people in prison. And that the people who, and some people were, were very good about following those rules the whole way through. Others though, those who made compromises with the rules and, and with the enemy, he found that those were the ones that broke down most quickly because they were on what he called a slippery slope. The idea being that once you break the rule the first time, it becomes much easier to do it again. A second internal phenomenon that you face when rules get broken has to do with the way that, as a leader, when you set an example that it's okay to break a rule, you send the signal to everybody in your organization now that they are free as well. You send it implicitly that they are free as well to make up their own rules as you go along. Uh, Another military luminary, a guy named Jim Mattis, a lieutenant general in the Marine Corps, uh, one of the ferocious fighters our country knew in, in Iraq, uh, renowned for his uh, aggressive approach to warfare, was asked here at the Naval Academy a while back, hey, what, General Mattis, what do you think about the situation where an officer held a gun near a detainee's head, trying to get information out of him, and fired the gun, didn't hurt him, but it was against the rules, Nobody was hurt. He got good information. Do you think that was okay? General Mattis made the point that what that officer did was tell all the people who were watching that it was now okay for them to break the rules and that you then really risk a breakdown in discipline in your organization. You lose control over it that way. Even people who want to do right are now confused about what the rules are. Uh, an Army captain named Ian Fishback wrote a letter to Senator John McCain in 2005 in which he begged Senator McCain, and, and you, should look, you should read the letter. If you care about leadership and ethics, you should read the Fishback letter uh, because it is from a young officer an articulate statement about why rules matter because when you don't have them and when leaders don't set them and make them clear, confusion sets in in the organization. So. All that to say that there's an internal risk to your organization for which you're responsible the minute you depart from a rule. I also think there are two external threats when you set the rule book aside. The first one is kind of the reverse of the golden rule. It's expect that others will do unto you as you've done unto them. We have a fancy name for it in the law called reciprocity. But what it really means is if you're in a situation and you're in a community where everybody depends on each other to follow the rules. And there, there's a balance and there's an equilibrium that way. And I think you'll find this to be common sense. As soon as one party departs from those rules, it opens the door and gives sort of moral sanction for everybody else to depart from those rules. Once more, a, a detainee example. And as you can tell, this has been a, a prominent issue in our military and, and in Department of Defense for many years. Early on, Many in the military argued against a new rule set for detainees. We argued that the Geneva Conventions ought to apply to the people that were in our custody. And one of the reasons that we argued was a very practical one, is that we don't want to do anything to anybody that we capture that we wouldn't want them to do to our own people. And the argument that's made against that sometimes is that it doesn't matter the bad guys are going to do what they're going to do. So we can wear whatever halo we want to and be as good as we want to about it, but they'll do what, what they want to anyway, so we need to fight at their level. And I think the point that people miss when they make that argument, and a lot of serious people make that argument, is that, for one thing, you've lost any ability at all to marshal any support from other members of your community to support you in trying to bring sanction or trying to stop the behavior of the people who aren't following the rules in the first place. So when you stoop to their level, you forfeited your moral high ground and your ability to call others to support you. And I think that applies on a macro level. It applies on a micro level. A uh, good ex interesting example just a couple weeks ago, the, the, the Nigerian fellow who tried to blow up the airplane on Christmas Eve, his father is the one who turned him in. And one of the reasons his father cited for turning him in was the fact that I believe that the United States will treat him fairly. If people did not believe that about us, then we don't get that kind of support 
on the individual level either. And I think those same kind of things can apply in whatever enterprises that you all are involved with. But I think there's a third risk that you face when you are setting rules aside. And in some ways, this is the most profound one. And I think it's largely external. And in some ways, it's the most difficult to judge. And that is that when you abandon rules, when you set aside rules, you are, in essence, turning your back on the values that went into the making of those rules. What do I mean by that? I think that if you are talking about the US Constitution, or at one end of the spectrum, or the, the bylaws of your fraternity, and an example that may be closer to home for somebody, you have to assume that those rules and the regulations and the things that govern that kind of conduct were formed through a, a deliberative process of some kind by, by people that cared a lot about your organization and the way that your organization operates, and that they're rooted in something important. So when you decide that those rules don't matter anymore, you better be real confident that you, you know what you're doing. Uh, you better be a confident person, and I would argue that you may be a person with some hubris if you decide that you're going to reject those rules such that when you turn your back on them, you need to know that people will sit in judgment on you. And they will sit in judgment on you and your organization. And the risk that you put your organization to may be greater than the risk from the crisis, from the crisis itself that you were facing in the first place. And I think you have to ask yourself, are we really in a crisis? Or is this more about my own ego and how people perceive that I'm leading the organization during a time of crisis? A couple of examples that I think are probably familiar to you out of, out of history for situations in which the rules got set aside. And I think we ask ourselves later on, A, was it really necessary? And B, what good or harm did it do to the reputation of the person involved in the institution that they represented? Uh, start with are a series of presidential examples. I think this happens every day around us, but these are easy because we all understand them. President Adams was worried about people criticizing the president, so he signed into law the Sedition Acts, which threw people in jail for free speech. It's a huge stain on his record today. He thought he had a crisis at the time that couldn't be met through our rules in place, which was the First Amendment. President Franklin Roosevelt, the internment of Japanese Americans. He thought he had a crisis at the time. Uh, how does history look back on what he did with Japanese Americans? Not with any favor at all. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon thought he was in a crisis. How, does people, how do people look back on Richard Nixon's handling of the political crisis that he faced? Abraham Lincoln, suspended habeas corpus. The Supreme Court told him you can't do that. He ignored the Supreme Court. And probably as much as anybody, any of the examples we just talked about, Lincoln got away with it. But it's certainly not why we revere Lincoln today. It's not what anybody thinks of as him being in his finest hour. So I guess the point that I'd want to leave you with on this subject of risk is that when you set aside a rule, you have abandoned values. And you may put your organization at more risk than it faced from any crisis that you were dealing with in the first place. I said I was going to talk to you about two temptations of leaders. The second one, I think, is also important and also very common, which is to make decisions in crisis without getting disagreement, without getting dissent, without getting opposing points of view. Why does it happen? I think people feel a press of time to make a decision in crisis. But I think it's a little more complicated than that. And I think it goes, in some respects, to psychology. Uh, in a crisis, there's kind of a codependent relationship, I think, that forms between a leader and followers or subordinates, which is this. In a crisis of all times, I think a leader wants to demonstrate that he or she is decisive and strong and knows what they are doing and inspires confidence. As such, a leader, particularly somebody who's not very secure, 
will be reluctant to have anything happen in the decision-making process, which reflects that the leader isn't any of those things, which shows any doubt on the leader's part, which shows that perhaps somebody subordinate in your organization may have a better idea than the leader does about how to solve the problem. I said it's codependent because I think at the same time, subordinates want their leaders to be strong and decisive. And because these situations are hard and they're complicated, I think it's very likely, and I've seen it happen countless of times, where a person will say, gosh, this, I'm not really sure what the right answer here is. I think we ought to be talking about this, but the leader doesn't seem to be taking us in that direction, doesn't want to seem to go that way. The leader knows more than I do about it, and so there's a deference, and there's a deferring to the leader, and the person never speaks up. I also think that nobody wants to seem, particularly in a crisis, like they're disloyal, like they are not part of a team like they're not completely on board with the objectives. And they're worried that if they speak up, their dissent, their disagreement, their raising another point of view is going to be confused, not with trying to get the right means to the end, but just a disagreement with the end altogether. And so they stay silent. Time is of the essence in these decisions. Um, people don't want to say anything that's going to be perceived to slow down the decision-making process. And that's what disagreement does, is slow down the decision-making process. So the risk, I think, that you run, run a very simple is making a lousy decision, making a catastrophic decision in a couple of respects. One, if you have a group of people that's deliberating on a decision, by and large, they're going to be from the same background. By and large, they're going to be like-minded people. If nobody's dissenting, if nobody's agreeing, then the chances are really good you're going to miss important perspectives that somebody outside that group might have raised, and you get a form of groupthink that sets in. I think you also miss the second, third, fourth order consequences that people think of if they've had a chance to think about something for a while and they have a chance to argue with each other about. That's all pretty obvious. I don't think you need anybody to really tell you that, but I think the key is what do you do about it as a leader? How do you get past this tendency to groupthink? How do you get past the tendency for everybody to agree on everything? I think you've got to do several things. I think you have to not only tolerate disagreement and dissent, I think you have to demand it. You have to insist on it. You have to encourage it in every possible way you can. And you have to start doing it before a crisis. You have to start doing it in every routine encounter you have with the people that you work with. When somebody does disagree, you need to go out of your way to praise them, regardless of what you think of the idea, but praise them and encourage them for having the courage to raise something that was kind of against the grain, counterculture, if you will. And I think you need to do it both publicly and private to affirm them as a valued person in your organization. As I say this, I realize how obvious this must seem to you, but the reason I think it's so important is because through 30 years, I've seen this play out over and over and over and over again. So as easy as it is to talk about it, it doesn't always happen the way we would want it to. I think at the end of the day, your, your obligation as a leader is not to be the smartest person in the room, not to be the person that appears to be in charge and driving everything toward its glorious conclusion, but your obligation is to make a good decision. And however you can get a good decision made, that's what you need to do as a leader. And if that means that the lowest person in the room comes up with the best idea that may even be different than yours, then you should be celebrating that and putting your own ego at the bottom of the pile. So I think that <clears throat> what I've talked about a little bit here today are, are by no means the only temptations that leaders face in a crisis. I think they're two really important ones. It's based on my observation and experience over a number of years. And uh, it all boils down to, I think, leaders who try to get rid of obstacles as they're making decisions during complex crisis or other situations. And that sometimes those obstacles are your best friend. You don't want to get rid of them. You want them there, and you have to be creative and disciplined and rise to a new level in making your decisions uh, in spite of those obstacles and even using them as, as an opportunity. I think I want to cycle back just before closing to the point about, and I'm sure you'll hear it from others. You'll probably hear it in your next panel discussion. But I wanted to cycle back to the point about values and the role of a leader 
in promoting the values of your organization. I think the title of your conference uh, has something to do with you know, crisis and opportunity, and I've tended to frame this in a negative way. I've talked about it in terms of risk. But I want to turn that on its head for a minute and talk about uh, the opportunity that you face, that you have in a crisis if you handle it the right way, which is this. To meet a crisis and to deal with it successfully and to deal with it in a way that reaffirms and lifts up and celebrates the values of your organization, whatever your organization is, in any organization that you're going to be a part of, I would venture to guess has some set of values that you care about and you're proud of or else you wouldn't be part of the organization. So if you can meet a crisis and you can reaffirm those values in this, at the same time, I think that's, that's the opportunity for a leader. There was um, no doubt you've all heard this, but I think in this spirit it's worth mentioning again the, the kind of uh, a couple of thoughts from uh, one in particular from Winston Churchill, who at the time was trying to rally his country during a difficult point in the war. The Battle of France had just ended. The Battle of Britain was about to begin. The Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin, and upon this battle depends the survival of civilization. Let us, therefore, brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves, and so bear ourselves, that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. I think that's what you want people to say about you coming out of a crisis, that you bore yourself as a leader during that crisis such that you succeeded, but you also succeeded in a way that will make not only your organization, but the people who watch your organization proud of you. So. Thank you, and be glad to talk about any of this if we have time to do it. Thanks. Good evening, sir. I'm uh, Michigan First Class George from Albany University, uh, New York RTC. And it's uh, such an opportunity to speak to you, sir, because I'm in a leadership and met ethics class like most of the seniors in RTC the Naval Academy are. And one of the topics that we covered recently was the obligation of the military officer that in certain circumstances, we can disobey a lawful order. Um, a case study we did was uh, an aircraft carrier was here, a uh, destroyer's here, and the captain tells you to turn right as the officer of the deck, and you can say, no, sir. Um, what are the legal implications of that? I, uh, and if you could just expand more on the topic, because as, a, as a, someone who's about to commission very soon, it was a really eye-opening point to talk about. So you'd like me to tell you how, it's, how to get off disobeying an order? When is it? I'm kidding. When, when, is it, when, is it, when is it right for an officer to, to ethically know, though the rules are set in place, to say, you know what, I know in my heart that I have to disobey this order, and that's the right thing to do? That's a terrific question. I was only I was being facetious with you. Um, the I think that any thoughtful audience would ask that question about the things I just said because <clears throat> I think at some point we would all acknowledge that there comes a point when it's appropriate and even morally required to say there's a rule in place, but no, I'm not going to follow it. And in, in your specific question, I've been given an order, which becomes a rule, and I'm not going to follow it. When is it okay to do that? Um, I'm not sure that I have a definitive answer for it, but I would think along the lines, I would begin thinking about along the lines of of two things. First of all, um, if, if safety is involved, takes us back to the hospital example. Um, and secondly, if there's a moral principle at stake. And I'm not sure that it's possible in a setting like this to elucidate it any more finely than that. But if, for example, you are able to say, uh, if I do, if I follow this rule, if I do what I'm, or uh, being what I'm told to do, somebody's going to be severely hurt or injured who is innocent, and I can break the rule and save that person or persons without hurting anybody else, 
then that would be probably one of the easier cases that might qualify as a situation to do that. Uh, I mean, the whole history, leaving your ship example for a minute, I mean, the whole history of our civil rights movement is involved, is made up of people who broke the rules. So, I mean, clearly, there are going to be times and circumstances in which rule breaking is not only uh, forgivable, but is, is right. And I don't know what to say in res the specific response to your question, other than that I think that all of you need to be as aware as you can possibly be, as well read as you can possibly be, as well steeped in the values of our culture and other cultures as you can possibly be, so that when the moment comes and you're faced with a situation, do I disobey a rule, that you're prepared to make it. And that's, that's not a very definitive or uh, checklist kind of answer. But I do know that, referring back to the talk that General Mattis gave when he was here a few years ago, um, General Mattis was talking to a military audience at the time, unlike today's audience, uh, I mean exclusively military audience, and General Mattis's point was that, you know, and again, those of you who don't know General Mattis or his reputation, this won't mean quite as much to you, but I can't really describe to you the ferocity of his reputation within the U.S. Armed Forces. But, and that's why I cite to Mattis. Mattis said, you know, there's always going to be 100 reasons to break a rule. And when it's all said and done, one of the best reasons for not breaking them is because it's a rule. Now, that doesn't have universal application. It, it kind of troubles me a lot, especially in a, in a civil rights context. But um, I guess my real message for you is, is that you better be real careful of it as a leader or as a follower. And if you're going to do it, hopefully you've thought it through uh, and are considering issues of safety or moral imperative at the time that you do it. Yeah. Okay. Sir, can I notice again from uh, West Point? Uh, I had a question on rules. Uh, at West Point, we have a lot of rules. And, uh, like, um, you know, I, talking to peers and stuff, you know, we kind of came to the conclusion, one of my peers said, told me uh, when I was back in school that, you know, if, if all we needed was the SOP and rules, then we wouldn't need officers because we could just give the SOP to the NCOs and they could run everything because it, it's just directions. So we need officers to, like, interpret the rules. My question for you, sir, is at what point, at what line, like, how much do you interpret the rules? Where, where is that line? Um, how much should officers versus NCOs be interpreting the rules? Like, where, where is that? Where is that at? That line. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that um, as, a general, as a general proposition, not as an airtight proposition, but as a general proposition, that it's probably more appropriate the more that someone has responsibility for the execution of a rule to be involved in the interpretation of the rule, which isn't to say that people who are subordinate in the structure of whatever the organization structure it is shouldn't be thinking about it and shouldn't be raising their, their own interpretations of it. But if you can afford to do it, it's usually best to raise that up to a person who's ultimately responsible for doing it. So, if we're talking about a corporation, we're talking about the CEO. If we're talking about the military, we're talking about a commanding officer and such. It goes back a little bit to the discipline point that we talked about earlier, that if we get to the point where everybody's kind of interpreting it on their own and making their own decisions about how it works, then you really risk sort of a breakdown in the, in the, the discipline of, of your organization. And any organization, no matter what it is, you know, requires a, a form of discipline. It's hard to answer a question like this in the abstract because no doubt anybody with a thoughtful mind out there could start rattling off a bunch of examples to say, well, we, you know, somebody's you know, in the heat of the moment and they've got to make a decision right away and the person is a, is a first year associate or a private. Are, are they allowed to interpret a rule? Well, they may need to. But as a general rule, I think the more responsibility that a person has in an organization, they probably ought to be the ones that are left to do, sort that out. Yes, sir. 
Hi, I'm Phil Cardwell from American University. And you talked about encouraging an environment where dissent is, is a normality. Um, how do you create an environment though, that is about dissent and critical uh, criticism instead of just complaining? So, in terms of, you know, there will always be complaints, there will always be criticism. How do you get an environment that is at least encourages only criticism, but at the same time, well, discouraging, you know, complaining doesn't discourage criticism as well? Yeah, and I think you can, I think you absolutely want to encourage criticism. So I, I agree with kind of half of your proposition. I think it's pretty difficult to discourage complaining. Because if you try too much to discourage complaining, that's going to get in the way of the other message that you're trying to send, which is that we want people to speak what's on their minds. We want to hear what people have to say. We want the benefit of your thoughts, whatever they are. And I think complaining is just sort of something that comes along with it. You put the net in the water and, and you're going to you know, you're going to get some gold and you're going to get some worthless minerals. But you don't want to tell people don't complain, I think. In terms of encouraging people to, to be critical, I think a lot of that goes in terms of the example that you set yourself. Um, at the, and sometimes you just have to be very liberal, lit, literal about it. Almost any meeting I have, uh, and I have a lot of them, uh, we are about a 2,200-person law firm, the Navy JAG Corps. Uh, I begin the meeting, particularly if it's people that I haven't worked with a lot before, by setting out a set of ground rules, which is that the, really the thing that matters to, the most to me in that meeting is that people say what they think. And I would prefer if they did it respectfully. I'm a person, I have feelings too. But the key thing is that people get out what's on their mind, and I ask them for permission to say what I think too, because a lot of times the phenomenon that you have is you say, tell me what you think. And so you say, I think X. And in my own mind, I, I really think X is really flawed, really crazy. So I have a problem. I've just asked you to tell me what you think, and you've told me what you think, and now I totally disagree with it. What do I do about that? I disagree with it. And I think in a really adult way, you, in, you tell people that, ask them in advance to give you permission to disagree with them without them then running back under a rock and hiding from you. And really to just try to encourage an adult conversation uh, which is respectfully conducted, but to over and over again emphasize the fact that what you're looking for is good ideas. It's not rocket science, and yet you'd be amazed how often it doesn't happen. Happily, it happens a lot too. I mean, this isn't to say that, in fact, it, it happens quite a bit, but it doesn't happen enough that it's worth talking about. And I think it's really important. Great question. Thanks.